guys. <laughs> okay, that's how we leave in the podcast recording so we know where to start. With um, all right. So we're going to pick up today. I was originally not going to show a snippet of this video, but it's got too much good stuff in it <laughs> to pass over it. And, you know, part of me wants to, you know, finish because finishing is good, but part of me also wants to make sure we don't skip over important stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we, 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 we started from the beginning here, so we might as well go ahead and do it right. This, you know, becomes the, becomes the position. But in some ways, it's interesting. We spent so much time talking about Roman history. We spent so much time talking about the uh, history of the Middle Ages. And then we talked about, you know, the, the Reformation in Europe and, you know, talked about what's going on in the Netherlands and the Swiss canons and all these other places to not give at least the appropriate attention to what's going on in the United States once they're the United States, you know, seem, seems inappropriate. And so, uh, Still last year, my you're probably just seeing a static image of me, right? There we go. Now Mickey's forced to see what I look like. Um, the um, so part of what I found tricky about this is like, oh, I already knew that. Why do we need to type that? I already knew that. But that doesn't mean everybody knows about that or has thought about it the exact same way. And then there were things that I hadn't really. Dots that I knew existed and were, were clearly defined dots for me, but I hadn't drawn the lines between the dots kind of kind of oh. thing. And so I think this is worthwhile. The context here is remember we talked last week, we watched the, the Reeves video on the first Great Awakening. So the way that I image this in my head, maybe it helps you <clears throat> is think of the first and the second Great Awakening as bookends. And the American Revolution is in the, is in the middle. <laughs> Uh, that's accurate. It's also overly simplistic <laughs> because, you know, things don't work that way where there's nice, clear cut things all the way. And really the second great awakening flows out of the American revolution and the first great awakening flows into the American revolution. So again, using the bookend analogy is a little bit, it's correct in terms of helping you get the concept of it, but it also has some known fallacies that you just need to watch out for there because th these were not, you know, and on this day, the first Great Awakening ended. And on this day, the second Great Awakening began. That worked that way. You can say that about the Revolutionary War to a degree in the sense there were the first shots and then there's, you know, then there's the victory at Yorktown. But even that's a little bit trickier because if you talk about the Revolutionary War period, it's not these dates. I did skip over that part so we don't do the deep, deep history dive. But, you know, roughly Aww. speaking, the Revolutionary history, Revolutionary War history roughly is 1765-ish right. to um, 1785. You might even argue finally with the adoption of the Constitution, right. replacing the Articles of Confederation. We're really talking 1788, 1789 in terms of that coming into being. But the actual war itself runs from 75 to 83. And uh, so that does have finite dates, but, uh, but what's going on around mm -hmm. those. And the thing to, to pick up off of this, and I don't know if we'll get actually into the second Great Awakening video when they started today, because uh, we're going to stop and discuss, because that's what we need to do. It's not just watch video time together, is um, pick up on how What's going on with the church in North America is interacting with what's going on politically in North America and the reverse. They are influencing each other. One is not the cause of the other. I think that's an important thing to grasp, but they are definitely influencing each other. And there are elements that get defined in the, in the late 18th century here in the 17th 60s to the 17, let's call them, let's call them the 1820s, actually, we're really going into the Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, that we still carry forward and live with today. This set very much of our national approach to religion, sacredly and secularly. <laughs> because we actually have, I would argue, and we can be political today as long as we do it politely and understand perspectives, is we have an American secular religion to a degree, whether we want to call it that, it acts like that. And he points that out. And that's not 
that it has its roots here, it's still going on. It looks a little different. It manifests itself a little bit differently, but it's still there. We have we have a there is an American. It's a it's akin to what you would find in other cultures of, as religion. It's it's part of our American culture. It, it's it, things that we have that we hold that connect. They do flow out of Christian principles. So that's where the connection exists. But they're not. Our patriotism is not our Christianity, and that's where that's where the real danger I think lies for so many of us is that it's easy to get those two things confused or so mixed up that it's hard to keep them apart. And that's I think that's the modern danger. It was a danger back in this day too, by the way. I think we have to make very clear here: all of the realities of the early American ethos as it moves from being a British colony into being its own country is moving actually away, at least by those who are the framers of the Constitution and of the documents related to the American Revolution. There's a movement away from overt denominational or theological affiliation within these documents themselves. The Constitution and again, these supporting documents are very illustrative of the ways men like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and others wanted to make sure that the breadth over all of the American colonies that would now become a nation could find themselves in these documents. So all these documents, and in particular the Constitution, restrain references to God to simply a bare acknowledgement of the existence of God or of his loving kindness and care over the nation. There are no specifics. It is a restraint to the bare minimum of a theistic understanding of the world. There is a God, of course, they do make mention of him. But trying to determine any of the particularities of the Protestant heritage or just of bare Christian doctrine based on these documents is simply impossible. Similarly, and more importantly, all of the criticisms and the justifications for the revolution were entirely secular. There are no claims to religious persecution or suppression. These arguments play a vital role, as we'll see in a minute. But there is no justification for the war based in the documents of the founding of America on a religious principle or on religious concerns. Everything is entirely secular, meaning that they are involved with merely the political world. Now, we have to be careful here, of course. In the 20th and 21st centuries, the word secular means more or less antithetical to religion itself. That's not really what I mean when I say the word secular. The word secular, historically, up until long after the American Revolution, just simply means things that pertain to this world, non-spiritual factors, economics, sociology, politics, these kinds of things. Now, obviously, in this day and age, all these things carry with them religious freight. Or another way of putting it is those who are religious, pastors and leaders of these kinds, could contribute part of the vocabulary or the grammar as to why these issues, these problems, are to be seen as justifiable. And so what we're going to be doing for the rest of this lecture is we're going to be highlighting the issues that are principally about the religious factors and the way that the church engages with the American Revolution. Now, what we're not saying here is that religion is the only factor, nor are we saying that it is the dominant factor. Rather, because this is a church history class, what we're looking at here are the religious elements and the way that the church engages with the world as it becomes revolutionary. So we're not minimalizing any of the standard story of the political and social ramifications of the revolution. This is not a picture of the Boston Tea Party. I guarantee you this is not how it went down. There were not people on the dock standing and cheering. <laughs> Well, there wasn't also that big tall yeah. building over Well, they, they quote-unquote the dressed up as, yeah, but... Um, it's a little light, too. Yes, because it was done at night. It was done in the middle of the night. Yeah, yeah this, this is well, a... Uh, this, this is, uh, you've heard the term artistic license. This is a great degree of artistic license for a real event in American history, but a great degree of artistic license. Um, but simply we want to highlight those that are also religious. Or you might say it another way, we're going to highlight those people who are religious, who are contributing to this world. Now, one of the more important things that goes on right here in the middle of the American Revolution is the church in the Americas have to decide if they're going to support or not support 
the Revolutionary War? Now, this is a harder question to answer than many people in the modern world are willing to admit. Simply put, the church has to figure out how reading Romans 13, which is Paul's call to obey the civil authorities that are over us, Paul is very clear, do not lift a finger in rebellion against the one who holds the sword, meaning the government. And there had been a long history of reading this text very, very concretely. It is assumed, of course, that Paul is writing in the context of Emperor Nero. So let's unpack this a little bit, because a lot of what we've covered as we've gone through this whole exercise, politics and religion have been mixed all the way through. If you think back to when you're picking back up in the first century, I mean, it was uh, the Roman Empire's interaction with what was left of the uh, of the Jewish state and the Jews. Ultimately, you know, all the way through, there's been the play of politics and religion. Constantine making Christianity the official religion of the empire, the breaking up. You know, all the way through, we, we Luther, you know, being protected by political authorities against church authorities, and this has existed all the way through. The common theme, though, has been. For Christians to look towards Romans 13. What does Romans 13 say? Render yeah. well, by, by the way, Christ says that. Yeah. Obey, those Obey those in authority over you. Yep. And when we've gone through the period of time here where we're talking about the divine right of kings, the concept was God mm-hmm. divinely appointed them to be over you, and you are, uh, and they are rightful authorities. Um, by the way, George the Third is uh, is is the King of England during the uh, during the American Revolution, and uh, in fact, there's some reason to believe he was not exactly well in well, not just a reason to believe it was clear he was not well in the head. In fact, <laughs> I mean, somebody heard of madness in King. He was there were issues going on with George the Third. George the Third was no Nero. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it, there was there was really not any overt persecution of, of any form of Christianity under George the Third. Tell me the name again, King George the Third. King George the Third. Okay. He was um, yeah, he was not he was not mentally sound. Was now was even for him was. English was not his first language. Uh, he, he was the first of the House of Hanover who actually spoke English, but it was not his first language. Yeah. Because we they had invited over, as Alexis would say, they had to do a cousin jump uh, to, to fix the English throne, and then it had to be a Protestant. So they ended up inviting over the German House of Hanover to take over the English throne with George the first. The first two Georges were neither born in England nor did they, uh, I don't remember if George III was born in England or not, but I know that George III was the first to actually speak English. Those first two Georges, which were short lived, didn't even really pa- speak passable English, even though they were the King of England. But my point here is that during the time of the American Revolution, if you're looking for a, a figure to say, we, we are being persecuted by the government, et cetera, et cetera, George III ain't that guy. In terms of religious persecution and he's nothing like at the time that paul was writing in romans <laughs> obey authorities you know most uh, uh, biblical scholars will tell you that was him writing about this guy and this guy was a persecutor and you've probably heard you can madness there too uh, <laughs> but uh you know the stories are are not exaggerated that Christians were lit on fire in the gardens of the palace at times, for example, or what went on in the Colosseum, that type of thing. That was real. So the question I want to pose here for us just to talk about scripturally is what is our obligation as believers, as citizens? Because this ties directly into what's going to happen with the American Revolution, but also where we stand today. I mean, I've kind of always heard it kind of put like, obey the authorities as long as they don't tell you to do something that goes against what God's told you to do or what, you know, is scriptural instructions regarding 
how we're supposed to live. So, okay, unless you would cause you to see the company. That's right. That's the way I've kind of always heard it explained. Yeah, in fact, uh, Romans 13, 1 says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except by God's appointment. And the authorities that exist have been instituted by God. So the person who resists such authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who <clears throat> resist will incur judgment. For rulers cause no fear for good conduct, but for bad. Do you think we believe that verse the way Paul wrote it today? Well, we don't like it. I mean, the idea that anybody can kind of tell us what to do or that anybody has authority over us. We just, we don't like that. We, we kind of want to oftentimes feel like we're going to do what we want to do. We're mm -hmm. going to, you know. We certainly aren't in the same situation that he was in. Right. Correct. Yeah, I, I believe it. I usually try to follow it. I guess it seems to be written there, but certainly our founding fathers did not seem to be following it the way it is written there. And who was it that first came up with the uh, the phrase "obedience to God is rebellion" or "rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God"? Uh, I don't know well, who, that who was first Jefferson said, or I don't know who first said it, but it was a widely shared yes, thought among yeah. among the founding fathers. Then also remember here, you know, the difference between then, I'm pointing to the screen here, meaning the time of Nero, then being the time of the American Revolution, now being now, is that it, in two of those three instances, the authority that was being placed there was not elected by a populace right. or an electorate. They were, they were there for whatever reason they were there, by might, by force, by tradition, by inheritance, blood. by blood. Um, that's you know so what's different about today when we talk about governing authorities is that um <clears throat> when you, for example reading the phrase by god's appointment you may say by god's pleasure by god's allowance whatever it is but uh you know god didn't god didn't punch a hole in a ballot <laughs> directly like you and i did when these authorities were elected for us and so i do think it, it, it was taking on a different tone by the time of the american revolution but it was also taking on, it's taken on a very different tone by the time we get to today because we have electoral politics that factor into this equation. So uh, that's where you get to, that wasn't, you know, that's not my fill in the blank of office here. He's not my, she's not my fill in the blank right. of office here. I didn't, yeah, but we collectively, you know, through whatever means voted for them. So they are, that, that's, that's the contract that we have as a, as a society. Um, so, that's what's different. What's happening in the American Revolution, we'll pick back, we'll pick back up here, is the fact that he, he very overtly stated there was not a, the, the biggest question for the organized churches were, are we going to support revolution? Or are we going to stay out of this? In other words, that, that was the role there because it was not, they were not rebelling for a religious reason. Tons of what had happened, as we've talked about in the last couple of centuries before this in Europe, were over religious reasons. That's why things were breaking up and reorganizing and you know, this king's Protestant, that queen's Catholic, and, you know, here we go kind of thing. Uh, that's not what's happening in, in, in the United States as a whole at the time of the, you know, the colonies. This is, I'm going to use the term United States, but I'm talking about before they're formally the United States, the colonial possessions, the, the, the 13 colonies, are, for the most part, Protestant. Right. That's not to say there aren't Catholics. And in fact, the one place where there tended to be more Catholics than any other uh, was Maryland. Uh, tended to be the uh, the one place that's there. But something I also skipped over that's important to note: while the um, the kings and queens of England had been Protestant, going back to him, going back to Henry, except for the the clips back and forth that we talked about and, and documented well. Uh, the majority of the colonies were. There were other. English colonial possessions in North America, primarily Canada. And in 1774, so right before the American Revolution, they passed the Quebec Act. Right. And the Quebec 
act altered the political structure inside of Canada in such a way, but also made that area, you could come and settle there as an Englishman without having to profess Protestantism. You could be Catholic. And so this became a haven, Quebec became a haven for English Catholics. And if you know the history that moves forward after that, a lot of those folks found their way to a neighboring state next door over time called Louisiana, which is one of the reasons why you have such a large Catholic influence in Louisiana is you have French, but also Acadians. English, the, the Acadians, but also English, displaced English that came Canada, Canada was a hotbed of Catholicism in the New World, and so when, when things move around and change, uh, many of them resettle uh, in, in, into American Louisiana. So the context, the background here, just to say this, is that Paul's writing in a period of marriage. The founding fathers are writing in a period of a, of a king, but very different than somebody like a Nero. And of course, we're living in a democratic elected Republic, which is a very different thing as well. Now, I mean, he may get into this later, but Thomas Kidd would, would disagree a little bit. Uh, the, the book that I've been reading for some time, I put it aside, I need to pick it back up again. Uh, uh, God of Liberty, he talks about how many of the churches, uh, there were the churches that participated in the rebellion, uh, tried to equate, even though England was Protestant, Try to equate the uh, Anglican Church with popery. Right. It, it, it was because of its. It, it was still a version. Of, we've used this term before, Anglo-Catholic. Yes. It was still very much a hierarchical, um, layered clergy, directly driven. And well, to this day, to this day, meaning August 1, 2021, the head of the Church of England is Elizabeth II. It is still the state church of England. She's, uh, she carries the title Defender of the Faith, even though that originally came from something entirely different. Uh, she's so, not going to give that faith up. <laughs> so so th that is still the case of, of that, which yeah. is not the case of, to, to your point, Doug, you're right, not the case of the of the American revolutionary churches in, in, in the colonies that were deciding what to do. They were, and they were a distinctly different, for the most part, form of Protestantism. That's why I talked about the difference yeah. between, you know, there were very few Catholics in the 13th column, Maryland being the highest concentration of those, still some in Massachusetts as well, but primarily Maryland, is that was, most of the rest were congregationalist of some variety, which also leads into how you get this form of government, because that was a more localized, Exactly. autonomous form. That's how these two things play back and forth. Our churches were influencing our, our the foundation of our nation. The foundation of our nation we're going to see allowed for a level of freedom when it came to religion that was also still also sort of unique at the time. And he is going to get into that here. So that's the interplay that's going back and forth. The great tyrant of the Roman Empire who burned Christians and did all kinds of nasty things. It was assumed then in terms of exegesis that if Paul could say that about Nero, how much more must Christians in the modern world, or in any age throughout the church's history, submit to the authorities that are over them? And this logic, of course, played a heavy hand in the submission to authority of all kinds that I had talked about earlier. What had happened, though, ever since roughly the 17th century, all the way down now until the latter half of the 18th century, is there arose what historians call the spirit of the Republican or the Renaissance virtues of the classical world. And what's in play here is very complex, but essentially what's happening is historians and scholars, people who are framing the thought life of the world, are reaching back to a classical period, to a classical mode, in which there was this idea that societies should be free and that what keeps it together is a heroic, and they often tended to say manly, virtue that the freedoms one has is always countered by the quality of the virtue of its citizens. Now, they called it manly because, of course, this is very much a patriarchal age, but also because this is how the Romans described it. Virtue is manliness, this kind of virile strength of integrity. Those who are powerful, those who have money, those who have wisdom, 
don't simply hoard it for themselves, but turn around and lavish it upon the citizens and the communities that they are a part of. This was very much part and parcel to the Roman Republic, the Republic that was there before Caesar and the Claudian Revolution in the first century. Now, what's important here is all these virtues, of course, are being described and discussed. There is a rapid increase of this desire for a more classical understanding of freedom and virtue. The problem, though, is, of course, is the Bible doesn't put it that way. The Bible says that we're sinners. And one of the ways that the Bible describes the political order is that it is a restraint upon the natural sinful desires, which lead to excess carnal living and the narcissism of those who are in power. Well, one of the big things that happens here, one of the serious developments within the church, is that this American ideal, this belief in virtue, integrity, the American way, that you're supposed to earn your way through this world, that you're supposed to be someone of rugged integrity and the inherent goodness of all people at all times, actually begins to become adopted within the life of the church. You can almost see the switch go off. From roughly this point in the mid to late 1770s, on into the next century, as we'll see in this lecture and in others, there is this rise of this belief, on the one hand, that the world is fallen, but the fallenness of the world becomes locked up in certain boogeymen, certain demonic forces, whether it's this group or that group or the Catholics or politics or something. But there becomes infused within the American church, within all denominations, frankly, this ultimate assumption that what is going on is that the Americas are a blessed nation that can carve out some utopian ideal based off of the virtues that are part of the spirit here. For example, during my lifetime, I have heard preached from pulpits, multiple pulpits, that America is somehow a modern inheritor of being a modern Israel. City don't exist. Yeah. I challenge you to find that in scripture because you ain't. <laughs> Now, conceptually, there may be things you can draw over to that, you know, because then you get into the question of more broadly substitution theology regarding the church in Israel. That's a whole other, that's a whole other question. But I saw many of you nod. You probably have heard similar, similar things that are preached. It's and again, it's this idea that he just that he just spoke to there is that yes, the world has fallen, but there's something different about us. That we can create this utopia. I hate to burst any bubbles. I don't think I'm, we're all, we're all adults here and older adults here. So we can say this, we ain't special in that way. We are, I do believe we are blessed by God by the thing. I'm not saying we're not, I'm not saying that we're not blessed by God because I believe we are blessed by God as a nation. He is, he has blessed us as a nation. I can, I can, I can adhere to the words of God bless America and, and the things that are there. And by that, but that we are uniquely chosen among the nations to be like a new Israel, I think takes this, in my opinion, too far and doesn't have any basis in scripture that you can really point to. I probably, and I hope Mickey can hear me because he probably would support me on this. I probably lean a little more toward that ideal than, than most of you in the room. Uh, I don't think we're a new Israel necessarily, but I do believe that the com a combination of the liberties that we had from the from the time of the revolution and the wealth of the nation and the uh, even though we weren't we we never have been a Christian nation in in the idea of Christianity being the established religion. The percentage of practicing Christians for a good part of American history being higher than in most of the Western world, and certainly in the 20th century, uh, the church being stronger in America than it has been in most of, of, of Europe, uh, kind of supports that concept. Vicky, the I agree with you. Agree? Are you? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I, 
I would take it a little bit further, though. I, I would think that we are obviously a blessed nation, but I think I also look at sort of things secularly, too. And I see that the, the immense amount of success of this country, I know that we have faults, I know we had a civil war, I know we had uh, all sorts of problems, but uh, in, in the long term, we're, we're working out of those uh, miserable uh, creations. Yeah. And uh, so it, it, why do we have that? huge numbers of people wanting to come to this country. The reality is that, uh, in my view, that capitalism and Christianity work. If communism works, I'd probably be a communist. But it doesn't. It fails, and it consistently fails. That's my thing. I think the way I would, I would work to reconcile that is I don't disagree with anything that's said there in terms of our unique character as a nation. And I'm very thankful that I was born here and not born anywhere else in the world. Um, but I, I think Doug even hit on the head. It, it is both a truism and a, I think a misstatement to say that America is a Christian nation because you have to define what you mean by that. Are we formally in a written document declaratively inside of our laws and our constitution a Christian nation? No, in fact, we are very we are very declaratively the opposite of that. I was going to talk about that here in a minute, in the sense of you know, Congress shall make no law regarding the establishment of religion. We we just we felt strongly enough about it that we put that in there in those words. Was the vast majority of American, I'm using that term loosely since it's the newly formed American culture Christian? <clears throat> Absolutely. Were the majority of the folks who were living in the colonies at the time of the revolution, would they have counted themselves believers in the God, Yahweh, the Christian? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they had maybe slightly different takes on that from time to time, but they were, the culture was Christian. And so one of the questions when we talk about it, is America a Christian nation? The answer is both yes and no. Formally, no. Practically, for most of our existence, yes. Undeniably, yes. Um, well, and, and, and part of it is, the, you know, this is why I frame out the difference between politically and culturally, because we are now a multicultural continuing to evolve to being more multicultural nation. What comes with that is different cultures. What comes with different cultures is different thoughts on who God is, the place of God, uh, spirituality in general. So we're, we're challenged by that. The, the analogy that I've often used, I'll use it again here because I think it's a good one. I graduated from high school in 1986. Not that long ago. Long enough ago that it's been a while back, but so into the 80s, every morning at Glenna Park High School, over the loudspeaker, there was a pledge, there was a Bible verse reading, and or a, maybe, I wouldn't call it a devotional, but some reference to that, and a prayer. The Youth for Christ organization that I was involved with supplied the people who did that each week to go down and do that in the office each morning over the loudspeaker. No one that I'm aware of objected to that in any major way. They may not have been super enthusiastic about it as 17-year-old or 18-year-old kids, but no one objected to it. No one filed a lawsuit. No one did any of the things that would most definitely happen today, even in Glena Park. Less likely in Glena Park than other places, but even in Glena Park, you'd probably see a lawsuit filed. And the reason was, even at that time, the majority of the culture, the population, was either definitely Christian or not contrary to Christianity. In 1986, if if um, if students for if students for Allah at Galena Park High School, which did not exist by the way, which is also making my point, uh, had gone to offer up five times a day over the loudspeaker, a call to prayer, what would have happened? There would have been backlash. 
So what's different about the two things? What do you mean what's different? Well, it has to do with the societal changes, the cultural and, accept, acceptance. And, of, and the norms, and the norms yeah. in society, the, norm, the, the norms are Christian normatives. And probably still to some degree are, but that's changing day by day, year by year. But the norms 30 years ago were definitely Christian, more Christian norms than they are today. And the norms 230 years ago, 250 years ago, were definitely Christian normatives. But at the right? time the colonies were being, yes, people were leaving for new opportunities. But weren't the people that were in England still, for the majority, considered, okay, maybe they were considered more Catholic or more Anglican, but wouldn't they have considered themselves at least church? I mean, they would have considered yeah, themselves yes, yes. godly. So yeah. good people. German, I mean, Germany was mainly all of the Netherlands and all of that. I mean, we've talked about their history and the people who were there and things like that. So even though people were coming here, again, we talked about how much, so much of it was for the economic opportunities. They were oftentimes saying also that it was so they could, you know, get away from the Anglican church or stuff like that. But I never really thought about the places they were leaving, not, not necessarily still being the church. There was just the differences in the church. Well, they still were the church. Yeah. And again, that's why he, when he makes the point of that this revolution was a political revolution, not a revolution fought for religious liberty, per se, by any stretch of the imagination. But that's that's not the American. That's not the narrative of the re revolution. The, the narrative of the re revolution is primarily what. In fact, I'm going to boil down to one thing. The thing you most often hear is taxation without yeah, representation. I'm going to say taxation is what I've always kind of. It was. It was. It was. It, it, was, prim it was primarily. And, th and those things actually cover both aspects of it from my perspective. The taxation part was the economic part. The representation part was, why do we need somebody across the Atlantic telling us what to do? Right. We've been managing our churches and managing our states here just fine. Now, England's take was, well, we just fought this war <laughs> to, to protect you They're from, you. Yeah, we protected you, you so. and, we, and we spent a lot of money doing that. So you need now to pony up for your defense, uh, the French and Indian War, which was the Seven Years' War in Europe, that, that really is the spark that ignites what was already pretty dry tender in, in the U.S. for this idea towards the idea of independence. So we, don't need, we don't need to be economically tied to England. We're more than capable exactly. of standing on our own self-sufficiently. And okay, yeah, you have, you, have, you have the biggest, baddest army in the world, or one of the biggest, baddest armies in the world, and okay, yeah, you know, you won... You won here because of that, but by the way, we fought in that to do that. So it's not like you. Just, defend ourselves. Yeah, it's not like you. But now you want to now you want to make us pay exorbitant taxation for that. And by the way, we had no say in that taxation. You just right. imposed it, and that that's what leads us to where we are. So it was a it was a it was a political response. But I, I do think there was some religious response too, and and you know the, as I said the the objection to papery, which was what they referred to as the Anglican Church. And perhaps that is how they managed to <laughs> reinterpret Romans 13, is that they were they were, were defending the liberty of every, what we would call the priesthood of the believer. They were defending the liberty of the individual Christian to, de to be their own determinant of their of their future and of, of their spiritual uh, determination. I think that's how some sense of religious liberty does get thrown into thrown into the mix of the causes of the revolution. I agree with that. And remember they're they're post Luther. And so they have the advantage of what Luther has done in the Reformation of coming along and saying, I'm responsible I'm responsible again, this is where that comes from. I'm responsible for my own exactly. Uh, and and it's my it's directly my relationship with Christ and with God. It's not through the, the church that this is delivered to me. You know, we talked about 
the whole concept of how sal you know, Catholic view of salvation versus the other the views that we hold to of Protestant views of salvation. The role of the church in delivering salvation is is even different. So the role of the role of how, how you manage yourself. But you know, there is this interplay here. I don't want to. It's easy to go down the deep political route here, but which we don't need to do. This is, we're studying the history, the history, the theological history. But understand that our political structure influenced American theology and vice versa. And, and, yes. And and much more so moving forward. We'll and, so, and I think sometimes because we. Well, not sometimes, but because we live in the political climate and we grow up with the political ideals that we grow up with, it's very hard sometimes to take that out of scripture and really just look at the scripture and what does the scripture really say? Because we have a certain worldview that we've raised with our entire lives. So reading scripture, sometimes we read it from a certain perspective, not even realizing that we're reading it from that perspective. So sometimes asking God to help us to really just see what he's really trying to show us can be really hard, even if we really want to see what it is that really is there, because we have all this other teaching, and, and it's not something where it's, where it's this explicit instruction where you're specifically taught this is the value system. It's those little norms and those little things that you just learn, because it's not written down somewhere. It's like, you're supposed to sit a certain, you know, there's just things that you learn, but they're not like Exactly. laws or they're not like these rigid things and so you just learn them and you read the scripture and think oh that all fits together and later you go Wait a minute. as god's teaching you and growing you is that really what that scripture is teaching me here because i know that scripture has been used to say that certain ethnicities are less than other ethnicities you know which really and truly that's not true if you actually go and read in revelation it shows that every nation, every tribe and every nation is represented. And how did the disciple actually know that without there being some way of being able to determine that? So I'm just saying, if you actually read that, then scripture didn't align with the other things that were being assessed the same, you know, one with the other. So I'm just saying that that, that yeah. really plays a lot into it. It, it does. Develops and, us. And then the other, the other, um, concept that popped in my head when you were talking about that, you know, you're talking, you're, you're going to talk about norms, the way that, the way that mm -hmm. we normalize things, which, which is a big part of this, is, I guess I better describe this. We have, we have difficulty with much of the language in the Bible that talks about lordship. And the reason we have difficulty with the language that talks about lordship is we have grown up in a democratic republic. Yes. And, and so this idea of an absolute authority of a of a real king. Yes. America doesn't have a king. We intentionally don't have a king. We uh, think everything should be democratic, but God is not democratic. Right. And so, <laughs> we, so, so we struggle with some of the most basic principles in scripture. Yes. Where it's actually our subtle, I know, our, I our subtle political, our subtle, our subtle ingrained political norms actually cause us to to push back yes, against I this agree. against this idea of what it means to be submissive how is how easy it would be for you to just bow down before someone oh my god i don't think so right and even when we go well, yeah it's god okay i'd be willing to do that for god we're not exactly i started to say no i'm not so sure but, that's always the case. because because god can we take a vote on this you know kind of thing that's you know. oh, well, i was gonna say to me, First Peter two, one of the number was even to a greater level than <clears throat> Romans, and then gives the example of Christ for us to look to yes. in that situation. And but in mainstream America, that's not looked upon that way. Not for people that are not Yes. Yes. And you know the. I remember very distinctly, and the person that taught my primary political theory course in college was uh, was an atheist, and was was pretty open about that and pretty clear. So he came from political. He came from the discussion, and very bright person, and knew political theory, the history of political theory very well. But he but he brought to that the extent you know the 
not a not a concept that that brought in actively brought in the role of God in our in our in our particular political liberty, for example. But you know the concept there, the the concept that's contained in Rousseau, for example, is this idea of a social contract that we enter into, which is that we choose. And this goes back to Hobbes, and it's it's well rooted in late medieval, early early Renaissance and early Reformation political writings of the day is this idea that we choose to give up some of our rights in exchange for protection and other things that, that, that it's a contract. We enter into a quote unquote, as Rousseau would call it, a social contract. So I choose to give up some of my liberty in exchange for protection and peace and security that I actively made this decision. It's, it's a contract. I agreed yeah. to it. I agreed to do this. Society has agreed to do this for me. And so again, one of the other things that we want to apply to our Christianity is we want to have our Christian contract with God, which is, okay, I'm going to accede to your authority on A, B, and C, but you're going to let me continue to be in control of D, E, and F. That's our, that's our agreement, right, God? Except that he's already made the covenant with us and said, this is my covenant. <laughs> and we're like, no, 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 we were amending that yeah. covenant. <laughs> well, I mean, and if you remember, you know, the example of that from scripture for me, which is, you know, I, I don't want the modern equivalent except I guess I do want it, but I don't, is that when he makes the covenant with Abraham, <laughs> Abraham didn't sign diddly. Yeah. In, in fact, it was God who was the only one that figuratively walked as fire through the ceremony of doing that because that contract required one signature. It was unilateral and it was God's. Mm -hmm. yeah. does, does he want you to voluntarily accede to that? Sure. Does he want you to <clears throat> accept that? Sure. That's, we've talked about that's the balance between what we talked about when it comes to um, um, Calvinism versus Arminianism. What is our role well, in choosing salvation? He knew that we couldn't uphold our end of the bargain. So he's the only one who can uphold his end of the bargain. Right. And then and subsequently, the, the, you know, if you will, just picking up this concept of contract, which is how it ties back to how we get to where we are in our political mm -hmm. union today, Israel was in covenant with God. Yeah. Broke their part of the contract. God kept his part. Of, it's still going to keep his part of the contract, despite the fact that they broke their part of the contract. Yeah. And so, again, we, we want to bring this modern, modern, little d democratic notion to our Christianity because of our culture. And to, to Lori's point, it's hard for us to divorce, to divorce ourselves of that because it's just there. We have to, we actually have to actively recognize that it's there to even say, oh, that's, well, that's not what the scripture that's, says. That's actually helped me in, in some of that is looking at just cultures in general and having to be immersed in other cultures and going, well, why do they do this this way? You know, and then it helps me to have seen that there's a different way of thinking about something. Is it just an American way that's helped me to be able to look at scripture? I, I still see scripture from obviously an American perspective, but it has at least given me the ability to go, oh, there is a difference here, and I do need to make sure that I'm trying the best I can to rely on the Holy Spirit to help me understand what this really means in context of God's word and not to man's um, ideals or ideas. Because we don't have it right. Well, it's always helpful to read it in the context of the culture in which it's correct. Because if you don't, you're more likely to which is back, which is back to his point when he, when he chose to have the slide there picturing Nero. When yes. Paul wrote that, he wasn't imagining some great. He wasn't imagining a benign George Washington leading the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. It was a cruel, tyrannical, anti-Christian emperor and Paul saying render under the governing authorities what's yeah. what's due to them well that that, that was you want to make the case yeah, it's hard for me to even fathom that right that. I, yeah I, it, and as a baby Christian I would never I, that wasn't you know growing up that was never really so much the part of the teaching it was just the scripture itself so it's only as an adult as I've gotten older that I had actually dug into more of the what is the going on at that time too. How how is that relevant? But you know, if you're not really taught how to do that or you just grow up a certain way and you don't ever think to go beyond that and you might not tell them some of those cultural perspectives and what was happening at the time. You're just reading the scripture that's there on the page. And you're right, when in, in 
we have the passage in Peter that gives us Christ being, and Christ was the example constantly of this. Yeah. Uh, because in, in, in Christ's case, in his actual physical walk on the earth, he was threading, I'm going to use that terminology by this kid, so I'll stick with it. He was threading two political needles. He was threading the Roman political mm -hmm. needle. He was also threading the Jewish mm -hmm. religious political needle. So, you know, that, that's why when he, when, when he goes to trial, there's two trials. He, he, has to, he has to stand before a civil authority in the case of the uh, in the case of Pontius Pilate, but he also has to stand before the you know the Sanhedrin and that authority for what's there because again the same question is being asked about what's the appropriate way for a Jew to act even inside of the Roman culture. And one of the things that's interesting to note about the Romans, particularly of that time, and thank you for reminding us about the importance of a historical grammatical approach to that's a hermeneutic. That's the I think that's the correct hermeneutic for us to use is. What was it actually saying? What was the person writing in that time to the people in that time saying? Now, yeah. not say you can't and shouldn't take the application from that. That's that's what you do. But understand what it was for what it was, not what you want it to be. We've used this analogy so many times before, you know, about, um, well, that's not fair. That's a very 20th, 21st century American small d democratic Western culture concept of saying, you know, it is fair. He's God. He can do whatever he wants to. In fact, fairness doesn't even play into this uh, as much as we would like it to. Justice plays into this. Righteousness plays into this. Holiness plays into this. It's not about fairness. The fair thing would be you're gone. Now, that would be the fair thing. It's only because of his grace that, that the, the quote unquote actual fair thing hasn't happened. <laughs> uh, and we forget that. Again, part of that is because we can't divorce ourselves from our our cultural political take on those things it's very we can't it's, you, you can't as much as even you're even aware of it you can't step outside of it you just hopefully don't follow the pitfalls because you're aware of it. and so to summarize sort of the rest of this so we don't have to pick the video up what he talks about here is that yes some of the anglican churches were more favorable to the crown and so there was some tension that happened between them but for the most part the churches were sympathetic to the revolutionary action but it wasn't fought there weren't speeches from pulpits necessarily per se, as much as there were political, that may have been the place where they gathered, but it was a political speech and not a religious justification that was being made. We come out of the backside of the American Revolution, having agreed as a nation, particularly by the time of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, we are distinctly going to say that we are not overtly a Christian nation, even though our culture is that of Christianity. Now, having said that, some of the states, Massachusetts being a good example here, continues as a state to actually have a have a state have a state religion because that was oh, their wow. background. But you don't see this. Virginia doesn't do this. Uh, other states don't do this. You don't, and the nation is we will make no law regarding the establishment thereof, which also means the role of government is also not to prohibit the exercise right. of religion. I do, I do think if you if you were to ask Adams or or uh, Franklin, or uh, any of the other authors of the Constitution, Madison, are you trying? Are you declaring that the United States is not a Christian nation? They would be kind of shocked. They they would they would not say no. We are not declaring it is not a Christian nation, but they would say we are declaring that there is not an established church. Yeah. Yes, I, I think I they would that. see the distinction between those two. And, and the reason for that is they didn't need to necessarily draw the distinction because it was the it was the cultural yeah. norm. Exactly. They probably never envisioned no. what we have today. And I would say what we have today, uh, it's fair to say, is an indictment of the church in the United States that we have allowed to happen. Well, we also know that God gives everyone free will yeah and so it is tough it's tough to walk that line of giving people the freedom well i'm not saying we should take away that freedom i'm just saying that we should not have we should have been more aggressive evangelistically <laughs> sure oh uh, but how many of the people that are right in christian right. churches yeah. Yeah. are yeah. actually walking with the lord you know what i'm saying so just because it's a christian nation and its people in a christian church 
doesn't mean their hearts are for the mission of God because the mission of God is to make disciples. It is not about making money. And this country is more about making money than what it's about. Well, and that actually leads well into where we'll pick up things next week with the Second Great Awakening is that the American Revolution at its core is a lot of things, but it is an economic revolution, no doubt. But and I just want to, if I don't mind, I just want to say that I agree with you about being proactive as a Christian nation, but we did not do due diligence. It's just that I don't think it, even in the hearts of those people that that was really their focus in the beginning either. And we're going to see this play out in the, in the Second Great Awakening, because what's already happened, you mentioned this in the remainder of this video, which I'll just summarize, is that American, America, generally speaking, was fairly, was relatively speaking affluent during this yeah. period. Oh, yeah. like that, mm -hmm. That's what, that's what drove the revolution was we don't need uh, someone who won't give us representation in parliament overseas to tell us what to do because we were, we're economically capable, capable, yeah. capable of taking care of ourselves and okay, yeah, you helped us fight against the French here and we won that war, but we did a lot of that fighting too. We could have done that on our own without you, in fact, maybe better without you. Um, of course, the great irony of that is that you know George Washington is the start of that war too. But that's a whole other that's a whole other thing. That's just one of the interesting things about Washington as a historical figure is the first quote unquote shots of that war are under his his command as a as a as a regimental colonial uh, militiaman uh, and uh, in the Virginia regiment the Virginia militia, and then later he anyway that's. And he was tactically correct, and the, and the British were tactically yeah. So 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 we have that going on. But what flows out of that in as to the early nation here, which is also still fluid, but still trying to find its its legs, but also the beginning of this concept of manifest destiny spreading away from the coast, is that we're going to see the role that in the Second Great Awakening, particularly Methodist and Baptist played in terms of evangelical preaching, revival preaching, but also just what was going on with the formation of the, of the church in America. And the point that Reeves makes in the latter part of this, 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 uh, this lecture here is that about the most that Americans will tolerate is, let's call it Presbyterianism. It's a, it's a, a synod level. Yes, it's a cooperation mm -hmm. among, among denominations, sort of like the Baptist structure. But he said, you know, as soon as you throw a bishop on top of that, Right now, now you've got another. You've got this hierarchy that seems very much like politically what had been fought against and had been won against, and to the extent that there was that describing of the Anglican Church as being a lot more Catholic than Protestant, probably, you know, that gets into play there as well. And so, the democratization of America also includes the democratization of the church in America as it spreads. And remember the backdrop here we talked about before, Wesley and, and the Method and, and Whitfield and others that were part of the Methodist movement is also right before this. So all of that is well set up for the for the early expansion of the United States with these this with Methodism being a big part of what's happened already and then continues to spread. And we're going to see that that's the result of what looks a lot more like the modern church than anything had before that. That's what we're going to pick up out of the, It's called Methodism. Methodism. We're going to see that being picked up out of the uh, out of post post revolution into the we go directly out of that into the Second Great Awakening, and then you're also going to see. That's all I, I think that I would call the positives <laughs> of American Christian expression. You're also going to see what you get when you take the lid off. And you're going to see the Millerite movements, and you're going to see the other things that happen that come out of that. Because the good news is you're free. The bad news that is you're free. you're free to yeah. think whatever you want to, whether that actually is supported by Scripture soundly or not. And that's that's the nature of the, a lot of the development moving forward, which is why it's relevant to what we're talking about here: the evolution of our theology. That plays into how we get to where we are today. And the other element about this idea of chosen nation, this ties back to. It's going to be picked up in that the lecture on the on the second great awakening apocalyptic thought starts creeping in really in a powerful way for a lot of reasons and there's i'll even i'll discuss this a little bit more because i don't think reeves does it as much but um um 
even the economic revolution of the industrial revolution and what that does to society plays into that. We, as an agrarian society, merchant society, we're pretty positive about things. Things get negative for the populace a whole lot more as we slip into the industrial revolution and what it means to become a factory worker that's spending 14 to 16 hours a day and all of the health issues that come with that and the the end it, America changes as a result of its industrialization and that impacts how our churches respond to it as well. Questions, thoughts? I, I strongly recommend again. I have the link. I'll make sure the link. I know you're planning to talk about this coming next week. So as the chosen. And we're going to trace this as we go through. But just to give the punchline, the churches that have the most impact from 1770 until 1900, roughly. I'm sorry, no, that's fine if you want to play the video. No, I, 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 I tried to shut it down. I accidentally yeah. started it. Okay, so as the chosen nation, which we've heard that a lot, that's. My assumption was that that's really more about just because we are so blessed as a Christian nation, but really Israel is the chosen nation. Is that where that conversation's like? But it's like we were the substitute chosen nation, uh, just like never heard of that. the Gentiles. In that sense, I mean, I've heard the idea that, you know, we are a chosen nation, but not like the substitute nation. Well, and, and that to me, that's part of where we're getting that. Where does our where does our Christianity end and our patriotism begin mm -hmm. and vice versa gets, gets thrown into that? Because again, as a as Gentile believers, we have been chosen by God. Yes. We do, I don't I don't believe in straight up substitution theology. I will tell you that's not that's not my place. I don't think but that, we've become part of the family. We we become we 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 have a relationship with God. We we have a destiny with God that is both. We're grafted. We're grafted yes. in that, that is similar to Jews, but is also distinct from. Sure. And um, but you know, e even that even that begins to creep in. I mean, it's. Uh, well, I, but know. here's the question: the question I have related to to um, my understanding of at least Jewish culture, that if someone was adopted into the Jewish family, they now become part of that family. Everything. Everything that was about their life is no longer that old life was gone. Like whoever they were a part of the family, if they committed crimes, whatever, all that past was considered gone, and they were now part of this new family, and they joined in with that family, and they took that family's name, and now they were known by that new family's name. So if that's a cultural ideal that sort of stems from my understanding of the word God, wouldn't that mean the same for us? I think, or am I misunderstanding? I, I think yes, and even what goes beyond that is the first real crisis to some degree in the church. We, we find in Acts 15, we find it's where the question the question becomes: to be Christ to be Christian, does that mean that you are a Jew plus, or 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 does it mean that this is something unique or different from traditional Judaism? And the church comes down definitively after struggling with it because there were different schools of thought inside but or else they wouldn't have had to gather together in Jerusalem of all places Jerusalem by the way to talk about it to me that's always amazing they chose to be there is that they went to Jerusalem to decide you don't have to be a Jew to be a Christian um, that was a major thing for uh, for example for Peter so to get past or for, even for Paul, for Paul to some degree but definitely for you know, Paul, Paul evolves on that tremendously we have Paul's writings on that but, hey, there's no requirement for circumcision. All those kind of things are not required. You come as you are. Yeah, and and so one of you know one of the things that we get down to even today in the church is what does it what now it come that, that that was that was the first question of what does it mean to be a Christian. We're still asking that question today, and so for example, you know the modern the modern movements of. Um, non-denominationalism for example or an expression of that to a degree can you can you be a christian outside the fellowship of the local church of course you can now can you walk out the full design no right and so then the biggest back can you can't so i think the answer is yes you can be saved yes you can be a follower of christ but are you fully recognizing and realizing what it's called to be a follower but we're told to be in in fellowship with one another. Yes. 
Um, what does that mean? You know, what does church discipline look like? You know, all these things that go with that are or tricky parts of what continue to be the conversation. And a lot of that, I know we're trying to get at it, a lot of that has to do with the fact that God made us specifically to be in community with one another. And it, I've had to learn that personally because I keep thinking I can do everything on my own and I don't need anybody else. Well, that's not true. And if we try to live in isolation, then we're not really living in that community way that he really intends for us to be a real body you know, just because I'm an eyeball or a hand doesn't mean I need to live my eyeball self here by itself. I have to be part of that body. I'm going to stop the recording so we at least, no, no, we can stop. I'm going to stop the recording so we at least have a little bit of time for. Uh... I'll just give it. Mickey said he was home because he's got a cold.